There's a passage in the canon where the Buddha uses the image of straightening an arrow to describe the practice. As long as the arrow isn't straight, you have to put it between two flames. But then when the arrow is straight, you don't have to put it between the flames anymore. The image was used in response to an attack that was coming from the chains about Buddhist monks not sticking with a harsh practice all the way to death. The chains felt that you have to burn away all of your past bad karma through pain. And only when all your past bad karma was burned up, only then you would die. That would be it. So from their point of view, the fact that the Buddhist monks stopped pushing themselves so hard was a sign that they had failed in their task. So as the Buddha said, you, while the arrow needs straightening, you still have to put it next to the flame. In other words, while the mind is still untrained, while it still has its defilements, unskillful states arising. There are times when you have to practice with pain, you have to practice with the restrictions, you have to make an effort. But then when you've freed the mind from those unskillful states, you don't have to put so much effort into the practice. You don't have to practice with the pain anymore. Nowadays, of course, the, the attack comes from the other side. Why should there be flames? Why can't we just appreciate the beauty of the unstraightened arrow? Why place restrictions on yourself? Well, the answer, of course, is that you have an arrow that's not straight. You may learn how to appreciate it as a natural piece of work, but it's not going to fly straight. You can't shoot anything with it. So there is a need for restrictions in the path. Some people complain oh, with all this effort you do and judging what's skillful and unskillful and being careful about the friends you keep and being careful about restraint of the senses, that doesn't seem very enlightened. We can't clone awakening. The path is not the same as awakening. The path is a process you have to put the mind through in order to come out on the other side. So you do have to choose the friends you hang around with. You do have to choose what you're going to look at and listen to and how you're going to look at and how you're going to listen to it all the way down to the other senses. And you do have to place restrictions on yourself. This is important. We're in training. Just as an athlete in training has to avoid certain foods and certain activities. There are things we have to avoid as well. When you look at the path, it's largely one of developing the right perceptions, seeing the value of generosity, seeing the value of virtue. Getting the mind in concentration, the Buddha said, is a perception attainment. You have to maintain the perception of breath and choose the proper perception of breath so the mind can settle down, so you don't forget and wander off someplace else. The perception is the marker that keeps you here with the breath, that allows you to remember, that allows mindfulness to remember. This is where you want to stay. And then there are the perceptions of the three characteristics looking for the inconstancy in things, looking for the stress, seeing them as not self. When you're developing concentration, you don't apply the, these perceptions to the concentration, but you apply them to anything else that would disturb the mind. And even when you're not in concentration, you many times find that thinking about the impermanence of things helps get you through some difficult situations. You're sitting here and something comes into the mind, you can remind yourself, okay, that's inconstant, and you're going to fool around with inconstant things, there's going to be stress. Is it really worth it? And the perception of not self is when you say, no, it's not worth it. You can let it go. Ultimately, of course, you'll apply the same perceptions to the concentration, but in the meantime, you want to learn how to look at the world that pulls you away from the concentration in these terms. Then there are what might be called the positive perceptions the Buddha has you keep in mind about nirvana, that it really is the true happiness. It's going to satisfy any desire the mind would have. 
for well-being, for a sense of security, peace. And it's a good thing. As the Buddha once said, if you see nirvana as something unpleasant, it's really going to get in the way of your practice. So you've got to see this as the most worthwhile happiness there is, and that it really is worth putting yourself through the practice, through all the difficulties involved in the practice. How does this relate to your friends? Well, how many of your friends have these values? How many of your friends perceive things in these ways? I read someone say the other day that choosing your friends, judging your friends as to whether they're helpful or harmful for the practice is a horrible thing. It doesn't seem very enlightened. Well, again, we're not enlightened yet. We're working our way there. To get there, you have to remember that you have certain weaknesses. If you're still influenced by the perceptions of your friends, you have to ask yourself, well, what kind of perceptions do they have? Are they the kind of people whose perceptions I should pick up? You hang around people and you may not be consciously picking up their perceptions, but it's a subliminal kind of thing. Dogen has a comment that being with other people is like walking through the fog. There's no one point where you say that your robes are getting drenched. Of course, Dogen was a monk. But you do fine. After all, you're wet. So what kind of fog do your different friends put out? And it's not the kind of fog you want to put, pick up. You may decide that some friendships you have to put on hold for the time being, because they're pulling you off in the wrong direction. Same with restraint of the senses. An awakened person can see and hear and smell all kinds of things and not be affected by them. But again, we're not there yet. Our work isn't yet complete. So when you're looking at something, you have to keep asking yourself, why am I looking? What's the result of my looking? Those are the two sides of restraint. One is your motivation in looking, and the second one is what effect it has on your mind. And this applies to all the senses. You have to learn how to see these things as part of a causal process and not simply as what you want to look at and what you don't want to look at or what you like and don't like. Because if your defilements have free reign in directing your eyes and ears and nose and tongue and body and mind, when you're out walking around dealing with other people, they're going to have the same effect as you're meditating. They get more power because they're given more, more free reign. And of course, the, the things they choose to look at and the way they choose to look is going to have an impact on your mind. So you have to keep watch over these things. If you notice yourself looking for trouble, i.e. looking for something that's going to excite your lust or something that's going to excite your anger. As John Lee says, turn your eyes around. Something that normally incites your lust will look for its unattractive side. Something that normally excites your anger look for its good side. You have to keep watch. And this is why heedfulness is the basis for all skillful qualities, Real with the realization that what you do, and this is not only how you deal with other people, but how you look at things and how you listen to things, your choices and where you direct your senses, your choices and what to do and say and think, really do have consequences. And so you have to be careful. You have to watch. That's we can get very confining, even for the fact that we're also developing concentration. And we're protecting our concentration because it is an expansive state of mind. All the Buddha's images in the canon are of full-body awareness. You gain the pleasure and rapture of seclusion, the pleasure and rapture of concentration, and let them spread throughout the body to the point where there's no part of the body that's not saturated with these things. It's a nice state to maintain. It's subtle, and it's very easy to drop it when you find that you have other concerns suddenly jumping into the mind. So you've got to take the time needed to protect it. 
because this is the nourishment, this is a sense of inner spaciousness that allows you to place restrictions on other things, other activities, without feeling too hemmed in. So even though there may be elements in your outside world that are beyond your control, the way you look and listen to things is in your control. The way you direct the mind, the perceptions you hold in mind as to what's worthwhile and what's not, those things are in your control. And so use that fact to nurture your, the development of your mind. This is a practice you can do anywhere. Here in the monastery it's easier because our basic values are different from the world outside. But even in places where it's harder, it's still possible. And you have to ask yourself, okay, what's really important in life? What has essential worth in your life? Take that perception and hold to it, for that's what will see you through.